Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Vice President Althea, Rotarians, good afternoon. Good. Um, I deal in large cylindrical objects. I uh, spent most of my life working on submarines. And uh, what we didn't hear is after I got out, I worked uh, in the nuclear power industry, and I was in charge of a centrifuge program, not for the Iranians. <laughs> and, uh, and at uh, ARL Penn State, uh, we may be in the middle of Pennsylvania, but we are the world experts in torpedoes. So if it's not cylindrical, I'm probably not interested in it. So what I have for you today, uh, and I always try to, whenever I'm going public, I try to make sure I talk about our Navy. Uh, I still feel like I'm in. It's, uh, Dan will tell you it's very, very difficult to shed your uniform after 30 plus years of service. And, um, and you, you want to always uh, keep current if you can, especially if you get in front of groups and have the opportunity to talk. So I'm going to talk about a little bit about Navy and Marine Corps team today, a little bit about tomorrow. Uh, and then I'll go into Applied Research Laboratory. I do have a, a video which will do most of the talking for me about what we do at ARL, all right? So that's the agenda. Um, so here's your Navy today. Uh, 54,000 officers, that may seem like a lot, but if you uh, say that half of those are uh, doctors, nurses, uh, restricted line like myself, I was an engineering duty officer, uh, cryptologists, intelligence officers, et cetera, uh, some of those communities that don't have very many enlisted people associated with them, that's all in that group. Uh, 265,000 enlisted, a bunch of midshipmen who are all, of course, trained to be officers. And we have a large reserve component who really have pulled uh, very, very uh, extensive duty in the last uh, you know, 16 years of war that the nation has been at. Um, and civilians, uh, 270,000 plus or minus, and they're the folks that, uh, that keep things going. In my command, when I was... Uh, uh, leader of the Naval Sea Systems Command, uh, we had about 53,000 civilians uh, and, you know, a very small officer cadre that, that was uh, running those, those civilians. Uh, today, uh, we have 280 battle force capable ships, uh, and that may sound like a lot, uh, just for perspective at the end of the Vietnam War, the Navy had 1,200 ships in it. Uh, and then during the, uh, the Reagan administration, we built up to about 580. Uh, so we've really, uh, we really reaped many, many years of the peace dividend. I, I, I've watched this because uh, I was commissioned in 74, uh, watched us wax and wane over the years. But uh, since 1992, we've been in a constant decline as far as numbers of ships. And you say, okay, well, we've been at peace, but the challenges that face the United States Navy around the world uh, and the country are, are ac absolutely myriad and uh, technologically pacing with us. So if you split that between uh, Atlantic Fleet and Pacific Fleet, and for every ship that you have on station, say in the Persian Gulf or off the coast of Korea, you have to have one going and one coming, and then you put 20% of them in overhaul, you get down to onesies and twosies in any area very, very quickly. Um, of those 280 ships, 91 are deployed, uh, and uh, 41 are, are, are off on local ops. Uh, believe it or not, we have a lot of airplanes, so 3,700 plus, but that includes all of the trainers, all the logistics, and, and in addition, all the carrier-based aircraft and the Marines. Uh, Carl Vinson, Theodore Roosevelt, and Harry S. Truman are all underway, uh, either deploying or headed out. We try to keep uh, one aircraft carrier in the Pacific, one aircraft carrier in the Persian Gulf, uh, and, uh, and then one uh, sort of in the Indian Ocean or in the Mediterranean. And uh, there are 11 aircraft carriers in the inventory right now. We just commissioned Ford, which was a pretty painful, $12 billion ship. Uh, that's the roster of the NFL for one year, by the way. <laughs> and Iwo Jima, uh, a large deck uh, amphibious ship uh, that is a helicopter carrier. They're 800 feet long. They're, they're not small. So that's, that's what's going on today in your Navy. Uh, in the Marine Corps, 182,000. Uh, 38,000 reserve, again, same, same thing. Uh, our reserve component is very, very much a key uh, to our success as an, as an overall service. Uh, we got a bunch of aviation squadrons there, and there's the aircraft that they're working with. Uh, I didn't put a picture of any ships or tanks or anything else because, uh, any ex-Marines in here? Oh, there gotta be some, all right? So the unit of issue of the Marine Corps is the rifleman, right? If you're, if you're not supporting that uh, lowest rank enlisted rifleman, you probably don't belong wearing a green uniform. I don't care if you're a pilot, a lawyer, uh, engineer, or whatever, 
everybody is a rifleman first, and that's why that rifleman is in that picture. Uh, I was uh, able to pull some of these things off the Navy website. Uh, it's interesting to see this is a carrier strike group. The aircraft carriers do not deploy alone, so typically they have a couple of destroyers or cruisers with them. If you've heard of the Aegis weapon system, all these ships have that Aegis weapon system on it. Uh, it's uh, it's an, an unbelievable radar system. It's now do doing double duty in many uh, areas uh, well, uh, ships patrolling out of Rota, Spain and ships patrolling out of Yakuska, Japan are now on missile defense alert uh, as we have rogue states that now have ballistic missiles that can reach uh, Hawaii and, uh, and most of Europe and soon continental United States. Uh, so typically these are the aircraft that are uh, flying off of that aircraft carrier. Uh, with a bunch of support helicopter squadrons. If you knew anything about the way helicopters were, we used to have helicopter squadrons home ported in the U.S. bases and then we'd send detachments off. We've changed that in the last six, seven years. Helicopter squadrons deploy with the aircraft carrier strike group. Pretty interesting uh, thing and uh, again those nuclear powered aircraft carriers are 50 year ships. Uh, we refuel the reactors at uh, about 25 years into, the, into their service life. If you think about uh, if the people that designed the Ford, we started designing the Ford in about 2002, all right, and we've just commissioned the first ship of a class where we'll build 10 of them, or 11, and uh, the last ship of that class will be serving past the turn of the century. So you better, you know, if you're a ship designer, you have to think 60, 70, 80 years ahead, what will, the, what will the climate and what will the world be like when that ship is still on combat duty with your great-grandchildren sailing? Uh, similarly. We have uh, an amphibious ready group, uh, and this is, uh, they look like aircraft carriers, they don't have catapults, uh, but they have uh, uh, Harriers, which are the jump jets, uh, uh, V-22 uh, tilt rotor uh, aircraft, which have taken a lot of our fleet, and then you will see more amphibious ships. So these, these, these are, the Marines have been fighting ashore for a very long time, uh, since 2001, and the Marines are now returning to sea, and this is how they return to sea in all of these ships. So the, the, the uh, the uh, role of an amphibious ready group is to be ready to go conduct a landing anywhere uh, on the earth within a, within a couple of weeks. It's, it's just the amount of time it takes you to steam over there. And so the aircraft and the ground vehicles are all configured differently, again, in support of that marine rifleman that I showed you uh, a few minutes ago. Questions? No. Uh, here's where the Marines are uh, globally. Uh, we're out there pretty much everywhere. And I used to be able to show this same picture for the Navy, but they pulled it off the website, probably for, out of security. Um, some folks in the Navy. We have a new Secretary of the Navy who's been in place uh, about a year. Uh, 3 August, okay, half a year. Uh, Rollins College, he was a Marine Corps uh, aviator, which is kind of nice because he understands uh, the rank and file uh, needs of the Navy. And uh, <clears throat> he went to work on Wall Street and then you can see he was in uh, investment uh, uh, firms and, uh, you know, a businessman with a military background. A really good guy. I've seen him speak a couple of times. Maybe you could get him here. I don't know. Uh, our, our chief of naval operations, uh, uh, Dan and I know this guy. Uh, when I was at, this is interesting, you know, if you're in the Navy long enough, you, you, you wind up to, uh, doing some pretty bizarre things. Uh, you did notice I was at MIT twice. Okay, that's 18 semesters. And yes, I am a Patriots fan. <laughs> but I was really happy to see Steve Wisniewski uh, just play his lights out uh, uh, as a Penn State guy on the Eagles, so it's okay. Uh, uh, John Richardson is our Chief of Naval Operations. Uh, he's a very, very smart guy. When I was teaching at MIT as a commander, he, w he came through the joint MIT Woods Hole program. Uh, as a lieutenant commander submariner. Uh, that means you have to get accepted at both places. Sounds pretty hard. I actually had to go steward a student who was accepted at MIT and rejected at Woods Hole. And uh, Dr. Bob Ballard was down there. He just found the Titanic when I was teaching and uh, we, we uh, put together a cabal of folks that did a whole bunch of submarine designs for him uh, and it was, it was wild times. Richardson was a piece of that and he went on obviously to command the submarine force and then he was the head of, uh, of the, uh, he was the director of naval reactors, which are the, that's, he was, so he was Rick Over's fifth or sixth successor, and he ran that and only got to run, that's an eight year job, uh, but he only got to run it two years because we short cycled him in order for him to take over the whole United States Navy. 
he is driving everybody because he sees this 280 ship force with 3,700 airplanes. Uh, we've hollowed out our force by uh, not overhauling it, uh, particularly the surface ships. You've heard about the collisions we've had uh, in the last uh, 24 months. There were actually four collisions, two of which were fatal. And uh, so he's working on that. Uh, but again, 25 years of peace dividend, uh, it's time to, to, uh, to double clutch and, and, and get working on you know, reforming the Navy and, and getting us to the, to the position where we are uh, able to handle two peer competitors in Russia and China and, uh, and also be able to respond to all the terrorist threats and all the rogue states and all of the non-state aligned uh, forces that are around the world. So he's got a very, uh, very tough job. And uh, I'll, I'll repeat something he said. Uh, the way he feels as our chief of naval operations is we've been, uh, you know, we're at the Super Bowl. Gosh, Super Bowl. Oh, well. Uh, and, you know, and it's 25 nothing, and we head for the locker room, right? That's the end of the Cold War. So we're in the locker room, and we're celebrating how well we've done in the first half of the football game. And then the referee comes in and says, uh, you know, are you guys going to come out to play? Because it's the end of the third quarter. And, you know, and the score is 20, 25 to 22, all right? So that's, that's where your United States Navy uh, feels it is. You know, we've been, we've, uh, everybody else played catch up while we were resting. On, I wouldn't call us resting on our laurels. We had two wars to fight, but uh, we haven't modernized and we haven't maintained an overhaul and, uh, and, and it's, really, it's really telling on us. So that's what he's trying to do. And you can see some of his, uh, this, is, this is his direction to the, to the whole Navy. Um, this is what we got out there, combatant ships, again, 11 aircraft carriers, the Nimitz class plus one uh, USS Ford, 14 ballistic missile submarines, uh, the Ohio replacement program will be known as the Columbia class. Because we will not refuel those submarines, we only need 12 of them because we don't have to stagger, uh, you know, do uh, cover patrols while the so boats are in overhaul for two years getting refueled. Uh, four converted cruise missile submarines, that they were the four Ohio class ballistic missile submarines, we are able to take off the front line and actually fill them with cruise missiles. Those carry 154 Tomahawks apiece. They're awesome. Uh, 54 attack submarines are actually down to probably just lower than 50 as we decommissioned uh, the middle of the Los Angeles class. Uh, guided missile cruisers, they've been in the news quite a bit because uh, they're very, very old and although they're combat effective, the hulls and the machinery of those ships are, are wearing out and we don't have anything to replace them. When I was running the Naval Sea Systems Command, we did a study of, oh, let's go see how we could replace the cruisers and uh, we decided it was just too expensive so we were gonna have to run them for at least another decade. Now we're paying that bill and we don't really have a solution other than to build more destroyers which are almost as capable. And you can see we have 60, oops, 65 destroyers, laser not forward. Uh, 65 uh, uh, guided missile destroyers of the Arleigh Burke class, they've been wonderful and we keep upgrading them and again they are, a lot of them are taking on the missile defense role. Another controversial program is the littoral combat ships. Uh, these are two different classes of ship with the same mission and the same designation. They were both evolved from ferry boats, fast ferry boats. We had a chief of naval operations who had been in command of a very fast gunboat and he wanted his ships to go 45 knots. Well, uh, most destroyers go about 30 knots. Most aircraft carriers go about 35 knots and submarines we don't talk about how fast they go. But to make a ship go 45 knots, and I'm the naval architecture professor here, uh, it's all engine room and fuel tank, right? So now we have uh, these littoral, these fast, Converted, well, they're not converted ferries. So I, I got in the, in the middle of this because I was the chief engineer of the Navy at the time. And we, we, we picked two of seven offerers for the littoral combat ships. And uh, both of them had parent boat designs that were, again, fast ferries. Well, uh, what do you think happens if you shoot a rocket at a fast ferry? Then doesn't do too well. So I had a lot of fight with the program manager over, are we building ferry boats or warships here? And so we drove the cost way, way up past the, they were 75 million a piece as ferries. By the time we got them into warships, they were almost half a billion dollars a piece. Uh, and, uh, but what people want, well, destroyers are now almost $2 billion a piece. So you can see the, the difference. What people wanted though, was they wanted performance of a cruiser 
out of a, which it would cost you a two, mil, two billion plus out of a half a billion dollar, basically built to re replace patrol boats and minesweepers. So nobody is happy with the LCS class ships, uh, but we're going to build about 35 of them. We'll see how that goes. Um, mine countermeasure ships, because all the LCSs are late, uh, they can't replace the mine countermeasure ships, so they're still out there, the Avenger class. If you look at my bio, that's what I started in. Yes, they are wood. Uh, the ones we have now are wood and fiberglass sort of uh, uh, well uh, blended together. Uh, and that's a very unglorious mission until you can't drive any of your ships uh, into port because your, your harbor got mined. Uh, we still have the uh, Typhoon class coastal patrol craft. Those are little guys. They're about 160 feet long. And, uh, and they, are, they are actually doing uh, uh, God's work in the Persian Gulf right now. Most of there's uh, how many of them? Tw uh, 11. Most of them are over in the Persian Gulf. They're home ported in Qatar, and uh, we, we drive them in and out, and they can go into real shallow water. So that's very, very useful. Uh, we were going to get rid of those on 9-11. <laughs> we, we had them slated for decommissioning. We're still driving them. Um, amphibious assault ships, I showed you some of these. All of these, uh, these last uh, few are all the ones I was just showing you the pictures of in the amphibious ready group. So that's what's going on in the, in the ship classes of the Navy. Uh, in addition to the Navy is the Military Sea Lift Command. We have any ex-Navy folks in the room? All right, well, the Oilers used to be USS. The ammunition ships used to be USS. Those are all USNS. They work for the Military Sea Lift Command. There's 60 to 70 of those. And these are some of the things that we've got. Uh, this is a fast combat support. That is a, that is a ferry boat, unmodified. Uh, and we drive these around. Uh, they're very fast also. They're about 35, 40 knots. And we can move stuff in theater, intra-theater, uh, very quickly with these. So we're using them all the time. Uh, we also have some combat craft, which are interesting. These are you know, kind of the, success, the successors to PT boats. We have these air cushion landing craft, which uh, drive Marines ashore from those big amphibious ships. And then a bunch of special operations craft. This is a, this is a Mark VI patrol boat, which is about uh, it's the size of a World War II PT boat, only a bit, little bit heftier, a little slower. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, it can take uh, SEALs and other folks around in theater to go do uh, interesting missions. I'll just leave it at that. Uh, a lot of airplanes. Uh, the uh, F-35 program, the trillion dollar program, uh, is, uh, is still in, mired in great controversy. Uh, however, we've already built 280 aircraft. It's kind of time to, okay, I guess, I guess we ought to just keep building them. And uh, the, they're very high cost. It was a very poorly orchestrated program from the mid-90s all the way up to, I want to say, about four or five years ago. They're shaking the bugs out of those airplanes, and they're going to be very, very good. Their, their electronic wizardry that's involved in those is, is uh, fantastic. Um, the Super Hornets are carrying the, the workload of, of the fleet. The CD models, the older Hornets, uh, are going to be retired. Uh, if you see a lot of Marine Hornets going down there, the C and D models, because they have too many uh, hours on them, the Marines did not buy the Super Hornet. They were waiting for the Joint Strike Fighter, and now they've got it. The, uh, the B model is a short takeoff vertical landing uh, airplane, and it's fantastic. Uh, a lot of electronic warfare uh, airplanes, and then all the rotary wing. I, I won't go through every one of these. Um, <clears throat> we do have, uh, as I was building out, I build models. As I was building out models of all the ships and the airplanes in the Navy, I discovered how many fixed wing large aircrafts we have. The P-8 Poseidon is the, uh, is the pat maritime patrol and submarine anti-patrol aircraft uh, that's coming online. It's based on a Boeing 737. You've all flown on them, right? And uh, they're replacing the P-3 Orion, which uh, have been re-winged once all the way through the fleet, and uh, we got to get rid of them. It's a great airplane, but they're too old, and including their derivative, the EP-3 Ares. That's the airplane that, uh, that got forced down in China a couple of years ago. And then the ones that you might not know what an E-6B Mercury is, uh, those, are the, those are the airplanes that keep the submarines in contact with the National Command. They're Boeing 707s, and there's about, I think, about 20 of them, and they just fly around with an antenna. They fly around in circles all day long. And now we're into unmanned. Uh, this is a, uh, an MQ-4C Triton, which uh, is the Navy version of a, of a Predator, and we have smaller uh, rotary wing uh, fire scouts that, that fly off the backs of destroyers in the LCS class. That's our airplanes. Uh, tomorrow, uh, ship, ship programs. Uh, I'm an acquisition guy, so I, I had to talk about the new stuff. 
Um, Virginia class attack submarine, I ran that program. It's, it's uh, not because of me, in spite of me, it's the best run program in the, in the Department of Defense. We're on hull about 12 or 13. I think we're gonna build about 35 of them. And uh, that's, our, that's gonna be our bread and butter attack submarine for a while. San Antonio class uh, amphibious transport dock. Um, very, very, very good ship. Uh, I have a kid who was the air boss on one of those, so I got to crawl all over that ship. Uh, the, 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 the destroyers and America class uh, landing helicopter assault ships. Uh, those are the big decks that don't have catapults that fly the marine airplanes. Uh, controversial, the Ford was, was huge, uh, but it is delivered now, uh, and uh, she's uh, about to start workups for her first, uh, her first deployment. Uh, Freedom and Independence class, uh, littoral combat ships, I already talked to you about those. Uh, we have a, a, a next generation destroyer called the Zumwalt class, uh, and that is a, a giant ship. It looks like something out of uh, uh, a science fiction movie. We're only going to build three of them because they became very, very expensive, and we'll have to go deal with those. The first ship of the class is uh, in San Diego getting her combat system finalized and, and tested uh, and ready to, ready to go to sea for, her, for the first deployment. So the Navy has to figure out with what we're going to do with a class of ships where we had intended to build 15, 20 of them, and now we're only going to have three. So, uh, but uh, that ship uh, has awesome power as long as we figure out how to use it correctly. Uh, constant bearing decreasing range means stuff that's coming. Uh, Columbia, SSBN, again, replacement. Uh, the, you know, those are the follow ship cost of hulls, um, what did I say, 12, hulls 2 through 11, the follow ship cost is, a, is supposed to be about $4.9 billion a piece on those. They're very expensive, but that's, that's our number one priority because that's one of the legs of the strategic triad. Um, we need to replace our old uh, tank landing ships, and we've got to build a new salvage ship. Uh, and then aircraft programs. Uh, we're renewing, uh, starting to renew most of our uh, fixed and rotary wing airplanes, the Joint Strike Fighter I talked about. Uh, we, we finally broke the, broke the code on how to do an unmanned aircraft landing on a U.S. aircraft carrier. Think about that. You know, if you've ever been on a flight deck of an aircraft carrier, it's an orchestrated ballet between the pilots, the handlers, the fuel guys, and the ammunition guys, and the catapult shooters. Uh, and the arresting gear uh, engines. Uh, and it all goes on at the same time. You got these 18 year old kids up there hurling these $70 million airplanes and the, and the pilots that it took $2 million a piece to train them. Uh, and, and your kids are doing this stuff. And uh, having a, something that doesn't have a person in it land and take off from an aircraft carrier was was pretty, pretty uh, scary thing for us all. But the uh, the MQ-21 did that, and they've been doing that for a couple of years. Uh, we decided finally, okay, we're going to go buy some of these, but we'll start it with it as a refueling uh, plane. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, I just looked at the budget. looks like that's been pushed out a couple of years. Um, sixth generation fighter uh, and the Triton and training aircraft. We've got, we've got a whole uh, generation of training aircraft that's aging out training helicopters and training fixed wing airplanes that we, we're gonna need to replace. Uh, summary, uh, the, the, the team is in high demand. The next decade is, is very exciting. I didn't talk about it, but cyber and security from intrusion in our communications to uh, having uh, everything vacuumed. Uh, Penn State College of Engineering uh, had, had a, ha a huge hack. Uh, everything was vacuumed and probably most universities with engineering and science in this country they don't know that, you know, they've either been hacked uh, and they know it or they've been hacked and they just don't know it yet. And, and I, I, as, a, as a person who, who works in this area a little bit, I cannot stress to you enough just how pervasive the foreign threat is in every one of our systems, every one of our systems. So, and yeah, my stuff's out there with, because I got my OPM information hacked along with everyone else that holds a security clearance. Uh, technically, the pacing threat is Russia. A lot of the things they know, they didn't back off on. They're very good at math and physics. They're very good at engineering. They're very good at metallurgy. And their high-end systems, they, they may have destroyed their military, but their high-end systems they kept spending on. They've already renewed their strategic deterrent. They're working on their, their, their the new uh, bomber is about to come out. Uh, 
The new missile's already been uh, tested and is deployed on inshore and also on their submarines, uh, and, and they're modernizing their, their fighter force. Um, uh, numerically, it's China. They, have, uh, they already have more submarines than we do. Most of them are, are, are diesel boats, not nuclear, but uh, they're, they're renewing all that. They're building a second and a third aircraft carrier right now, and they're taking over reefs in the South China Sea and calling it their territory. And uh, they paid off Greenpeace. That's why you don't hear about Greenpeace. They've destroyed uh, lots and lots of, uh, of pristine reefs in doing this. And uh, if we had done that, Greenpeace would be all over us. It turns out they paid them off, it turns out. I thought that was interesting. Um, and cyberspace allows uh, anyone who wants to fight us uh, to come into our computers. So uh, life's pretty exciting right now. I want to shift gears. This is what we do. This is where I am. 34 years in the Navy, uh, came back. Uh, Penn State is a, uh, is a, a, a giant place. Uh, there's, I think, 48,000 students there. I have 1,200 people on campus, and uh, uh, we do wonderful things. We're one of 14 university-affiliated research centers, and uh, five of those work for the Navy. The big dog is Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. We're the second biggest. There's one at University of Texas, University of Washington, and University of Hawaii. So. Uh, I have a video, it's a little glitzy, but everything you see in this video, we touch in one way or another at ARL Penn State. Can we run it? I'm keeping my fingers crossed here. The Applied Research Laboratory at Penn State University has helped secure our nation for 70 years. When Dr. Walker brought his 100 people here in 1945, our nation was standing down for its largest war ever. The vision, however, was to sustain the culture of innovation and development in order to keep that nation secure. Today, we are challenged as never before on the sea, in the air, in space, and in cyberspace. Thanks to the men and women of ARL Penn State, we are up to that challenge.
I love that video. <laughs> but now I gotta come back down to earth. So let's talk about um, what we do. Um, can you read that? You probably can't read that. That says, that says we got 1,200 people, uh, including about 200 students. Uh, today I think we have almost 1,300. And uh, yeah, well it should be, yeah, you gotta get it up to full size. Hit that guy, that's it right there, bingo. Now you can almost read it. <laughs> Our core competencies, acoustics, communications and surveillance, fluid dy dynamics and propulsor technology. Uh, every submarine propeller or propulsor since uh, we've been doing nuclear submarines has been either designed or helped been designed at uh, Penn State. Guidance and control. We have a facility in Warminster, pretty not, not too far from here, that does all the precision navigation for all of the ballistic missile submarines. Materials and manufacturing. Uh, Penn State is the tops in additive manufacturing, if you've heard of that. Uh, we do composites, uh, we do power and energy, uh, we do a lot of systems engineering, we do a lot of work for the intelligence community. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about our facilities in a minute. Uh, some of the things we're working on, anti-torpedo, torpedo. This is protecting uh, every aircraft carrier that goes to the Persian Gulf because if the uh, Iranians come out and decide to pop a couple of torpedoes off of one of our aircraft carriers, these little six and three quarter inch diameter, very, very modern torpedoes can actually go hunt down and kill those torpedoes before they hit the aircraft carrier. Uh, pretty wild. Uh, autonomous undersea vehicles. Uh, this one is 38 inches in diameter and about 30 feet long. It's going in the water this week out in uh, Keyport, Washington, along with uh, Navy handlers, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, lasers, uh, undersea power and en energy, and uh, and uh, again, a lot of, we have about 40 people working in cyber warfare. What is a UARC? Uh, it's a special relationship. We, all, we have our primary contract is with the Naval Sea Systems Command, or the Navy, uh, and we are supposed to be responsive. We're supposed to uh, maintain uh, the, our core competencies, and they're all listed in a, in a, in a document that's run by the, the, the Defense Department. We're supposed to be able to uh, be quick, respond, and we're not allowed to compete with industry. So we're a resource for the Navy. Think trusted agent. Uh, on the right-hand side are technology readiness levels, which you probably don't know about, but uh, both Department of Defense and Department of Energy have the same uh, scheme. TRL-1 means it's uh, some scientist going and doing some very, very basic research. <laughs> TRL-9 is it's in production, so you can see all the graduations in between. Uh, we tend to take stuff out of basic research and get it into prototyping. We're really good at that. And when we prototype something, we'll work the bugs out of it, test it, so get it uh, ironed out to our, our sponsor's uh, satisfaction, and then turn it over and they'll go off and, uh, and work and send it to industry for production. These are our facilities. Uh, that undersea vehicle is at a key port. Our key thing is our Garfield Thomas water tunnel, which is right on campus. When they moved from Harvard, that's, that was the quid pro quo, we'll build you the tunnel. I can test stuff to 12,000 PSI in cold salt water over in Annapolis. Here's the Warminster precision navigation. And we got some energetic stuff here. A large anechoic chamber also in Warminster where we can uh, measure signatures from uh, DC to light on anything. Uh, including airplanes and submarines and boats. Uh, here's a, Penn State spent $830 million in R&D last year. Of that, uh, these big chunks here came through uh, us. We, we took in about $260 million last year from uh, DOD. Uh, and uh, the university, uh, all the rankings, they rank each department of the university by how much R&D money they get and spend. And uh, so College of Engineering, and science, uh, various departments. Uh, they're in the top 10, if you consider ARL's work, they're in the top 50 and maybe lower if you don't consider ARL's work. So we're a big part of the, of the university. Mostly, I'll say we fly under the radar. Uh, uh, in the 1960s and 70s, defense-related things weren't really welcome on college campuses. I have to tell you, uh, our relationship with President Barron and the, the provost and the dean uh, are, it's very, very good right now, and the university is pretty good to us. And it's nice because we get to go look at uh, thesis work uh, at the, that's unclassified, publishable stuff, and then we go take it and we apply it, and all of a sudden it's super classified the next day. So I'm like a kid in a candy factory. You saw all the stuff in the video wherever I turn. I'm, I'm talking to a PhD in blue jeans and sandals 
uh, who's off building something that nobody thought could be built. And uh, it's all for the defense of our country. Pretty cool. That's all I got. I know we're getting late, so uh, I'll take questions.